our practices were so intense because Phil, the mastermind behind everything, would put MJ on the second team. And me and Scotty would be on the first team. This is how big of a competitor he was. And Will knows this story too, right? So we're playing this game called Tonk. And, and I'm beating him out of his money, all right? And, and I'm beating him. And this is about 11 o'clock at night. Because I was a you know late second round pick. I didn't know if I was going to make the league. I was on a non-guaranteed contract. And I'll never forget one of my first exhibition games, we played the Bulls. And I was just trying to make the roster. And Michael Jordan gets the ball right in front of our bench. And I'm already scared to death. Like, God, I hope I don't get into this game. I'm, <laughs> I'm not ready for this stuff. And he holds the ball out. He holds the ball out and he looks right at me. And I'm on the bench just kind of like, he holds the ball and he goes, watch this. And he turns, he went right around Dan Marley, bam, dunks it, looks back at our bench and just starts laughing. And I'm looking like, <laughs> there's no way in hell I can ever make this. Michael was so dominant, not only on the court, but in the locker room, you know, and, and so everybody felt uh, more a sense of, we're gonna win because we have Michael. So there was a comfort level with his confidence and his uh, his dominance, his, his sort of um, you know king of the king of the, the hill mentality. So you you went into every game like yeah he's you know, he's on our side, but you went into every practice like I better better not get on his bad side, you know. And and so it was an interesting combination. Um, you know, he raised the level of every practice so dramatically. Um, everything mattered to him. Um, every shooting drill, like he was so competitive. And so, and we used to scrimmage a lot more back then than we do today. Uh, most, most practice days we would scrimmage at some point and those scrimmages were, they were battles. And uh, so he, he, you know, he, he wasn't the easiest teammate to play with. In fact, he was probably the hardest teammate I've ever played with. But it was really productive because because he was able to raise the level of, of our competitiveness, but also our confidence. Because every practice day almost felt harder than games, you know, because you had to deal with him. With MJ, nothing was off limits. <clears throat> your mom, your, your mom, wife, your, your kids, wife, your, your brother, your dog, you you name it. Um, nothing was off limit and that's that competitive nature that he had um you know a kid named labrat for smith used to play with the uh bullets wizard um he had 38 points on mj mm. and we had to play him the next night mj didn't talk to anybody walking off the court and everybody was saying oh this is the next mj and he had scored those many points yeah. on mj the next game we played them in their home, t uh, in their arena, MJ had 40 at halftime. <laughs> and you never heard of LeBrad for Smith again. <laughs> Our practices were so intense because Phil, the mastermind behind everything, would put MJ on the second team. And me and Scotty would be on the first team. And the, being competitive like he was, man, un unreal, unreal. And you know, of course, pu punches got thrown. Uh, many fights and I'm just so happy that social media wasn't back then. <laughs> Typical Phil, you know, running this play and Will set a legal pick on MJ. <laughs> MJ said, Will, don't do it again. What are you talking about? That's Will. MJ said, all right, Phil said, ran it again. So naturally ran it two more, uh, two more times, legal pick. MJ walks up to Will. The next day on the plane, Will gets on the on the plane with a huge shiner. <laughs> well, Mike and I really didn't have a great relationship. We had we respected each other um, um, as teammates um, in terms of um, us having one goal, and that one goal was to win championship. Um, we didn't hang out that much off the court. Uh, he had his set of friends. I had my set of friends. Um, you know, only person I really hung out with was, you know, uh, Scotty. Um, I mean, we were at places together all the time. So as far as changing, um, I think you have to ask MJ that question because 
you know, we won't close at all. Well, he called me a whole bunch of things my first year. And believe me, I called him a whole bunch of things as a rookie. Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when you come into a situation like that and you know that, uh, um, you know, the star player on that team didn't, didn't want you, you, you got a chip on your shoulder. You got something to prove. And, you know, I worked my butt off. You mean, my mentor was Charles Oakley. Man, I mean, what a great human being when I say that. And I say that sincere. Um, he taught me so much, especially in practice. He used to kick my butt, you know, uh, over 60, 80% of the time in practice. But I learned from him. And, um, and I just kept working, man. And, and, you know, I guess you can say the rest is history. Still that kid from Frio who was reshaping himself. And MJ was three-time world champion, best player on the planet, had his own shoes. And there was me and there was him, and somewhere between us was the rest of the team. And we had to figure out how to be together. And it wasn't his priority, but it was mine. I'm deeply thankful to MJ for showing me how to be a better basketballer, for compensating for my weaknesses with his brilliance. I didn't love MJ. I thought MJ was difficult and unnecessarily harsh on his teammates. and probably on himself and I think, you know, I just didn't enjoy being around him that much. And that was cool. It was cool with MJ and it was cool with me. There was no, at the end of the day, we found a way to respect each other on the court and to, to coexist and that was cool. These are my three championship rings. Uh, and some people play their whole lives, don't get one. I stumbled into three. Thank you, MJ. Thank you, MJ. I think a lot of players found it a little bit difficult. Uh, Michael brings a little bit of a, a different type of pressure to the game. And um, I think a lot of the, the players that was, you know, had came there and gotten very comfortable uh, realized that they had to go back and restart. Bulls needed Michael Jordan to be successful. No doubt in my mind. Um, I needed his personality, his demeanor, um, and I needed his aggression that he brought uh, day in and day out. It was uh, not an aggression in my eye, but more of a drive. A drive that, you know, helped us to be successful, not just him, but me, the team, uh, the organization, Luke. Uh, I think we all um, saw that um, he was he was a different creature in terms of how competitive and how driven and just how he uh, went about things. But I think it was something that. Uh, we all jumped on and, and enjoyed it and I guess in some sense uh, wanted to be uh, framed in that sort of uh, way as a team. We weren't meant to be that way and I say that even about Michael, he probably wasn't meant to be that way but the type of trail that he had to blaze to get a championship uh, probably made him want people on his team that were willing to fight for him. And uh, in that sense, he, he sort of uh, put himself um, in a position each and every day for teammates felt like that they were being challenged by. Michael Jordan is the biggest thing in the game. And now you have a chance to be a part of that. Um, as other players, they, they felt like that they were walking on eggshells. And you know, that's just, uh, how they felt initially, I think. But I think uh, as the days grew longer, and you know, 
we went into several seasons, their comfort zone became um, something that they realized that, oh, he was like that, but it's not, it wasn't that bad. Michael, in my opinion, will play with him for so many years. He was just the ultimate competitor, man. And, and aside from being on the court, like I, we were playing cards at my house one day in Charlotte. Here's another story. This is how big of a competitor he was, and Will knows this story too, right? So we're playing this game called Tom, and, and I'm beating him out of his money, all right? And, and I'm beating him, and this is about 11 o'clock at night. This guy does not go home until 7 o'clock in the morning until he wins all of his money back. Yeah, they had a game that day. We, we played him that day, okay? And the thing is, is that most people will say, oh my God, Michael Jordan's off my house. Oh, you know, I was ready for Michael Jordan to leave. <laughs> I was like, dude, would you please go, just leave, please. <laughs> but he wouldn't until he won all of his money back. That's how psychotic of a competitor he is. We, we, were, playing, we were playing the, uh, the Bulls here in Chicago, I was with the New Jersey Nets at the time, and Jimmy Jackson is just giving it to Michael and Scotty in the first half. He just, you know, just killing them, right? So Jimmy Jackson starts talking crap and everything. So Michael looks at him. This is this is in the first half. Michael looks at him, and says, "You know what?" He he used another word, but he says, "You're talking a lot of crap to have my shoes on." Ooh. Jimmy Jackson didn't score another bucket that game. <laughs> He's talking about the ultimate shutdown, man. Jimmy, Jimmy looked down, he did have his shoes on. He had the jump man on. <laughs> when I got traded to San Antonio. Yeah. So now these guys have already played on the, the, the dream teams already happened. All this stuff's already gone down. I get traded to San Antonio. And one of the first things that David Robinson says to me, Michael Jordan's got to deal with the devil. <laughs> There's no way you can do the things that he does and live the lifestyle that he lives and be as effective as a player. Yes. And I just started laughing because then the stories from, you know, the dream team came out to where those guys would basically, let's just start with practice. They'd get on the bus to go to practice, come back from practice, go straight to the golf course, Come yeah. back from the golf course, mm -hmm. straight to the casino, stay there until it's time to go to practice, go to practice. So Rob, Dave said he tried to keep up with these guys. He goes, I just physically couldn't do it. He goes, that guy's got to deal with the devil. There's no way you can do all these things outside of basketball and still step foot on the basketball court and drop 50 on somebody. That's the thing that I learned later on right. about him. Because, you know, at the moment, you're just focusing on games, you're focusing on playing, um, was, and that's the one thing he never really revealed, yeah. is where he got that from. I don't know if he got that from his mom, his dad, that he saw the bigger picture of knowing, because that's the, that's the one thing I always talk about, of knowing what it actually is going to take to win championships and the sacrifices that you have to make. Because I always laugh now, like after the last dance came out, you got all these players talking about, oh man, Michael Jordan, I'm not letting him talk to me like that. That that would never happen. You know, he's not gonna disrespect me. And I'm like, well, that's probably the problem of why you've never been on a championship team. Because this, did I like how he talked to me? No. But when you start looking at the bigger picture and you think about what you're trying to accomplish, it was like, you know, the things you want to focus on are petty. I was fortunate enough that, you know, it wasn't just Michael Jordan. It was also uh, Bill Cartwright and John Paxson. And the ability of these guys to take what he says, pick it apart, and then put it back together to where you're just like, hey, Bill used to always talk about Cartwright. Just, just look at the bigger picture. Don't focus so much on how he says something, but think about what he's saying. Because if you take it personal, this is this whole thing's gonna go south. Michael Jordan was a score first, second, and third. He was a phenomenal, phenomenal finisher of the game. And what I mean by that is Michael Jordan stopped playing the game. He stopped 
having to facilitate. He didn't have to do all those things. He just finished the game. He finished it. He was, I think, the game's greatest finisher because he had no weakness in his game. When he played the game, especially in the fourth quarter, we know we refer to him as a three-dimensional player. He's either going to score, he's going to get fouled, or he was going to have or go to the free throw line and make the two free throws. And not many players can do that in the last four minutes of a game. Jordan was the best. He was just three-dimensional in every way, every phase of the game, especially coming down the stretch. If I put Jordan in this era, no hand checking. I mean, the guy averaged 37 points a night with hand checking. What would that translate into today's game where, there's, where you can't touch him? Now, who's the best? I think I'm biased. I would say Michael Jordan, just because mentally what he was able to do, and I knew him, Michael Jordan is not going to back away from any level of competition or, or any you know player that comes up. I think LeBron James would meet the challenge because he 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 will pose some problems for a player like a Jordan, any player, because he's 6'8", 260. But I would have loved to see the matchup, but I'm going to say Michael Jordan without question.